Uh, first of all, it's great to be here. Thanks for the intro. I appreciate y'all having me. Um, like I mentioned, this is very casual. It's a nice, intimate crowd. So if I say something, I'm going too fast. If you guys want um, some clarification, just raise your hand, yell at me, toss something up here. Uh, we can talk about it. Otherwise, I'm just going to plow through and I talk fast. So um, as we were, t I was thinking about topics and was talking to the organizer. Um, it was interesting because this is kind of a newer uh, compilation of ideas that we're talking about today. I was speaking at a conference in Amsterdam last week, and the, and the topic of the conference was 60 40 portfolio, so 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Um, a lot of people ha expect that there's low expected returns going forward. What can you do about it? Are we stuck? And so we kind of came up with this title. And so we'll talk, walk through it today. For just a little more for those who aren't familiar that want to find more information. Um, I write a blog, which is just my name, mebfaber.com. There's over 2,000 articles on there. Uh, my business is Cambry Investments. We manage uh, a little bit over a billion in assets in 10 ETFs. Um, we have a private research service called the Idea Farm. You can watch me pick fights on Twitter. And we have a podcast in which uh, was mentioned our most recent podcast sponsor is actually a skiing pass that gives me free days at Chamonix. So I'm so bummed out because I didn't bring any clothes, any skis, any equipment, and I was full expecting all those ski mountains around here to be closed. And sure enough, of course, they get a bunch of snow this week, and I'm, I'm living through a lot of um, FOMO or just melancholy about it. So, but good to be here. I'm happy. I'll drink some beers later. Uh, we've written a bunch of books. Uh, you can download one for free if you go to that domain, uh, the Global Asset Allocation one. Um, we'll probably have a new one coming out next year. But uh, part of this topic weaves a couple theories from global value and global asset allocation. Uh, plus, the books are only about $3 each, so it won't break your budget anyway. Um, I think it's really important uh, as a money manager, but also as a speaker or someone who is willing to stand in front of you or anyone at the CFA that if you're... Um, trying to tell someone you know, your theories or in many cases sell them something, you should always ask that person, in my mind, what do you do with your own money? Because there's so many conflicts of interest in our world. And this is an example of this chart, by the way, is mutual funds in the United States. And it goes to show, because you have to disclose, what percentage of them the manager actually has nothing invested in their own fund. And you can see in many cases, it's not just a majority, it's up 70, 80%. And the manager has less than 100000 invested. So the actual the theme of this presentation is what I do with my own money. This is how I manage all my own money. So at least you can see this isn't just theoretical. Uh, this also, and this is, of course, the, the GIF from um, Titanic. Uh, hopefully I'm not going down with the ship. But if, if I did, you would understand um, at least my interests are aligned. So let's talk about expectations. When I sent over the idea for this talk, the organizer actually... Well, I'm one slide ahead of myself. I want everyone here to think in their head, and we passed around a sheet in Amsterdam, but um, I won't do it here because it'll take too long. What would you expect your portfolio or your client's portfolio, if you're a money manager, to return over the next 10 years? You don't have to tell your neighbor. Don't embarrass yourself. Don't say it out loud. Just think. What's, what's the number? Well, there's been a lot of surveys over the years, and this is a recent one by Schroeder's, and they always end up saying the same thing. And, um, all right, so everyone's got their number in their head. All right, you ready? This was the number. And you guys can download it from that address if you want. It sounds pretty high to a lot of people. A lot of professionals in the room that are money managers would say that seems like a pretty high return expectation. By the way, the millennials in this survey were 11.7. So I see a few younger uh, uh, people in the audience. Um, and so when I was emailing the organizer about the topic, he said, no, no, no. Us here in Switzerland, we're not going to expect that much. Bond yields are too low. We don't expect 10 point something percent. And if you find it, you click on that survey, Europe is, is just as high as everywhere else. What do we call that? We call that setting the bar too high, I think. This poor girl is like a lot of investors. When you, <laughs> when you mismatch expectations in reality, you can set yourself up for disappointment. I could watch that all day. Um, why do people assume 10% returns? And this, this talk isn't US focused, I promise, but this is just a good um, demonstration. It's simply because that's what stocks have returned in the past. If you go back to 19, early 1900s, these are real returns, by the way, after inflation. 
for a couple other reasons. But my favorite investing book, Triumph of the Optimist, if you haven't read it, go buy it. It's about 100 bucks though, so pick it up at the library. Or buy, uh, go online to Credit Suisse. They have a yearly update called the Global Investment Returns Yearbook. It's free. But they take back like 25, 30 countries with really long history of stocks, bonds, bills, returns. And Switzerland is actually pretty close to the U.S., slightly lower stock returns, slightly higher bond. But in general, that 10% number, I think, is because people anchor to that's what stocks have done historically. In the U.S., it was like, I think, around 9.7. Um, and then a couple of other unrelated to the talk, but a couple of other interesting points. One's bonds and bills had the same return for vast majority of the 20th century. So there was no premium to investing in 10-year bonds versus investing in short-term bonds, only really until the bull market um, from the 80s through today, you see that expanded return. But a good rule of thumb, if you think of stock bond bill returns globally after inflation, as we call it the 5 two, one rule, stocks have returned about 5% after inflation, bonds about two, and we're rounding up, <laughs> bills about one um, globally. Anyway. So expectations is because people are driving, looking in the, in the rear view mirror. So if you look back historically, back to the 1920s, these are the returns. Stocks, bonds, the volatility, obviously stocks is triple that of bonds. Maximum drawdown, huge. You sat through an 80% plus loss in the Great Depression. Bonds, of course, were lower. 60-40, that's what everyone does. They put the two together, diversification, finance 101, probably learned it in CFA level one. Two uncorrelated assets, you end up with a slightly better risk-adjusted returns. But if you look at the drawdown, pretty darn high compared to uh, bonds as well. So still risky, dominated by stock risk. Should we expect stocks and thus this portfolio to return what it has in the past? I promise you, don't start falling asleep already. This is the only equation today. And this isn't my equation. It's John Bogle, Jack Bogle's equation, founder of Vanguard. Started index funds in the 1970s, now manages trillions of dollars, changed the investment business. But in the 90s, he was talking about this, put out a paper. He said, look, it's pretty easy to forecast what stocks will do over the next 10 years. There's only three components. Starting dividend yield, earnings growth, or dividend growth, we'll call it, and change in valuation. That's it. And we put a picture of Stephen Hawking on here because his editor famously told him, every equation you put in the book, you're going to cut your readership by half. So the, the equivalent here would be a couple of you falling asleep. No one's nodding off yet. Good news. So that historical 9.7% returns, and, and the quick math students here will notice does, this doesn't exactly add up because I took averages. Quick government work. But distill it into the three parts, 4.2% average dividend yield historically. 4.7% earnings growth and a slight bump in valuation from stocks starting the 20th century at lower valuations and ending them recently at higher valuations. Well, let's plug in the numbers now. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll move away from the U.S. in a moment. If you just plug in the numbers now, 2% dividend yield, we'll give, let's, let's just give us historical earnings growth. May not be, but and no change in valuation. Well, that already drops you down to 6.7%. And for the nerds out there, the quants, we don't spend much time on this, but you could actually explode this number into two parts, which is real earnings growth or dividends growth plus inflation. And so some of you would say, well, Mav, there's actually not 3% inflation in the world right now, but dividends growth is also going to be higher than it was historically, particularly in the U.S. because of buybacks. And a lot of people don't account for that um, because it changes the equation. It doesn't increase. The dividend yield will be lower, but the dividend growth will be higher because of buybacks. But they balance out because inflation is low. So let's call it 6.7%. However, we haven't talked about valuation. So valuation, it's hard for a lot of people. And there are a million different valuation indicators. This is our favorite, but we'll talk about a few here. Um, this is nothing more than the 10-year price-to-earnings ratio. You take the price-to-earnings ratio of the stock market, this is the U.S., average it over the last 10 years, adjust it for inflation. This was um, introduced by a Nobel laureate Bob Schiller who is at Yale, and he wrote a couple books and white papers in the 90s. He called it the CAPE ratio. It stands for Cyclically Adjusted Price Earnings Ratio. Well, he took it all the way back to the 1880s. I don't know how he did that, but he did. But what you can see is that over time, it's all over the place. It's been as low as 5. It's been as high as 45 at various times. You can see market historians can pick out the, the big moves here. You got the Roaring Twenties bull market. Of course, you got the Nifty 50 is all the way down to the, the low starting point, the generational buying opportunity at the end of the inflationary 70s, early 80s, the massive run-up 80s and 90s into the tech boom, the internet bubble, crash, uh, 
came back up, crash, global financial crisis, got really cheap in 08, 09, and then you're back up to a number of around 31 today. Average over time is around 17, but you can see it's all over the place. Is this even useful? If you go back in history, put the CAPE ratio into buckets um, versus 10-year future real returns, you can find that it's not rocket science. The less you pay for something, the higher the future returns are. You pay less than 10, historically, uh, returns in the stock market are double digits, all the way nice stair step down. The bad news is with that value of 31, historically, future stock market returns have been low. So let's ignore CAPE ratio for a second and go back in history and say, what were the three best starting points to be an investor and what were the future 10-year returns? Future 10-year returns were almost 20% a year. If you started the three best, three worst is zero. Terrible timing, terrible luck. Man, it'd be awful to start a career around this. This is probably, you know, March, uh, December of 1999. Um, but let's look at the characteristics of those starting bull and bear secular markets. Three, the three best, starting dividend yield 5%, gone are those days. Um, but the starting valuation of those times was also 11. And by the end of the decade, you could see valuation doubled, expanded from 11 to 25, which gave you an 8% per year valuation tailwind. But look at the three worst periods, what happened? The opposite. Valuation went from 28 to 13, 7% per year headwind. So if you kind of gauge, try to gauge where we are now, you say, okay, 2% dividend yield, 31 on the CAPE ratio, probably closer to a secular bear and then the start of a secular bull. Now, if you've got any gamblers in the audience, I saw there's a casino here, um, any blackjack players, any poker players, it's really boring. CNBC hates it to go on to TV and talk the way I do, which is there's a whole spectrum of future probabilities when it comes to returns. Everyone wants to think in binary terms. Your clients, your investors, media, they want you to say, no, no, I'm a romping, stomping bull. I think stocks are going to go up. Or I think stocks are going to crash. I think it's terrible and they're going to do it tomorrow. It's really boring for a client like me to go on TV and say, you know what? There's a whole spectrum of possibilities. Here's what's probably likely. The market's not in a bubble at 31, it's high, future returns are probably low, but, and ignore this last line, I forgot to delete this, that's just an extra line. So what's most likely? What's most likely, if CAPE ratio goes back to a value of 17, long-term average, you're doing 1% per year. If it goes back to 21, which is the average when inflation is tame, so if inflation sits in this 1% to 4% safe zone where everyone feels warm and cuddly, where uh, people are willing to pay higher cash flows on future stock market returns, which makes sense because they're more certain, you get about 3% a year. So higher, but not great. If you stay flat, we get back to that 6.7% uh, return. And if you go back to the worst, you can come up with some scenarios here. I don't know what, but if you go back to 10 or 5, you're looking at negative returns per year for the next decade. Now notice, for stocks to go to hit the 10.2-ish expectations, stock valuations have to go back to the all-time high they reached in the internet bubble. So it's almost guaranteed investors will be disappointed um, going forward because they're expecting that high du double-digit returns. But in reality, you have to see valuations. Could that happen? Yes, it absolutely could happen. A lot of people usually stop me at this point and say, Meb, Meb, CAPE ratio, you can't use it. Here's the 10 reasons why. Pull their hair, accounting's different over the years. It's too long of a ratio. It's too short of a ratio, yada, yada. There's a thousand. Every valuation indicator should, when markets are expensive or cheap, should line up and say the same thing. I cannot find a valuation indicator, if you know of one, let me know, that says US stocks are cheap. So here's another one. This is from Ned Davis Research. It shows the median company in the S&P 500 by valuation median price to sales ratio. And so any valuation indicator, you want it to get the big muscle movements, the big turning points correct. Was it cheap in the early 80s? Yes. Was it expensive in 2000 and 2007? Yes. Was it cheap in 09? Yes. Were the highest value it's ever seen and it's not even close. So the median uh, price to sales is around 2.4 when it's been as low as 0.4 before. You could come up with some reasons why that may be, but the fact is, it's, it's, and it's true. And if you look at Medium price to cash flow, price to earnings, price to book, they're all hitting all-time highs. Usually not a good thing on valuation. All right, well that's depressing. Tuesday morning, afternoon, not gonna invite Meb back again. Um, talking about these low returns. What about bonds? Well, you know what bonds are gonna do. 
it's even worse here in Switzerland. And by the way, anyone want to guess what Switzerland's CAPE ratio is? It's about 25. So better, but not much. Um, bond, you know what bonds are going to do? Bonds are just going to give you the yield unless they default. So in the U.S., that's two and change. Here, it's Zippo. Um, and so but diversifying into bonds is also risky. A lot of people, I think, get this wrong. They think nominally bonds don't have much in the way of drawdowns, but that's not the big risk for bonds. These stalactites are historical drawdowns on a real basis after inflation for both stocks and bonds in the U.S., and it goes to show that the stock risk is crash risk, right? You have the Great Depression, you have the two uh, on the right in the past decade, but bonds, the big blue, you notice is a lot more has to do with inflation, particularly the 60s and 70s, so it's that slow erosion of capital. So they're just as risky as stocks are, just from a different sort of standpoint. So again, most people do that 60-40. They diversify. They say, I, I don't know what to do. But let's plug in those numbers. What are good expectations, reasonable expectations for 60-40? All right, so we said st we'll be generous. We'll say go, go back to normal inflation times. Stocks of about 3%. Bonds, 2.2-ish. Just like this poor dog can't get it. Oh, he finally gets it. Can't get it. Can't can't just make it work. Sixty forty gives you two point seven percent. What does the average pension fund in the United States expect? Eight percent. Eight percent returns. You can't add three and two together and eight, get eight percent returns. What do clients expect? Ten percent returns. Put the, put in the numbers for Switzerland. It's not much better. Stocks would be a little higher. Bonds would be a little lower. So what can we do? Are are we just? Um, are we just stuck with this sort of, well, you can put it all on Bitcoin. Um, all right, so message, message one. On the, the first part of this presentation, kind of dour. Take your medicine. It's like going to the doctor. Lower your expectations. Set low expectations for your clients. Spend less. Save more. That's good advice no matter what. Um, going back to Stephen Hawking, you know, he said when he was diagnosed with, with his situation and when he was 21, he says, my expectations were set to zero. Everything above that after was gravy. So if you set your clients, friends' expectations to where, say, look, you expect about 3% returns, um, prepare accordingly, and hey, you happen to get 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, great. I'm brilliant, that's why you hired me. So what can you do? Let's talk about a few things, what you can do. So first, almost no one owns the global market portfolio. If you were to just go out and buy the world, and if you think about indexing, going back to the 70s, that's all indexing ever meant. It's been so totally polluted today, you could come up with the most insane indexes. You come up with an index and say, it's gonna be whether the CEO wears a tie or a bow tie, we're gonna charge 3% a year for that. It makes no sense. It's going to be terrible for the investor, but that's an index. You can come up with an active fund that buys the top 100 stocks in the S&P and charge 0.01%, which is a great fund, but it's active. Um, so it's been totally polluted. But what it originally meant was market cap weighted portfolio, and that's it. So if you were to buy the global market cap weighted portfolio of publicly available assets, it's roughly half stocks and bonds-ish, and roughly half U.S., half global X US. We did this in our book. We kind of distilled it. No reason to spend too much time on this. This is what we came up with. There's been a couple academic papers that come up, try to tease it out. It gets more complicated if you include private assets because obviously real estate is a huge chunk, farmland, etc. But in general, this is broadly speaking what it looks like. And so we said there's no reason in a, in a modern world to think about just two assets. And this isn't labeled on purpose, but Everyone tends to think of just in terms of stocks and bonds, but here we have 13 different assets going back to the 70s. Market historians can probably pick out a few. There's gold, there's um, all sorts of corporate bonds, real estate tips, all sorts of good stuff. But you can see the whole takeaway is they all zig and zag. They all move up and to the right, which is good, but they zig and zag all over the place. So one of our books that we did, um, Global Asset Allocation, we said, look, all right, there's been all these really famous investors. So these guys collectively manage in the trillions. You got Rob Arnott, Research Affiliates, 200 billion and change. Dave Swinson from Yale, Mark Faber, no relation. We also got to draw a, a kind of villain mustache on him after his recent comments in his newsletter, if you're familiar. Um, Mohammed El Arian from Harvard Pimco, now I think retired. Uncle Warren Buffett and the Ray Dalio, the largest hedge fund in the world. All these guys have publicly stated, here's a portfolio I think individual investors should have. 
going forward. Like, here's an asset allocation portfolio. So we said, all right, let's go test this horse race. Let's see how these have done. And these were very different. So here's an example of just a few of them. And in the book, we tease these out into much more granular. But the three main moving parts, stocks, bonds, real assets, you can see they're very, very different. So for example, some of them have over 50% in stocks. You know, 60, 40 is obviously 60. Arian, which is the endowment style portfolio, a lot in growth, a lot of growth assets. Some have very little in bonds. Some have a lot in bonds, over half. Some have nothing in real assets. Some have 50%. Okay, so hugely different allocations. And you would expect this to make a monster difference because that is what we talk about all day. That is literally what the three levels of the CFA curriculum is about. How to value assets, how to put these portfolios together, what is the best risk adjusted return, how much time and brain power we all spend on these massive staffs of 10 or hundreds of people to put together these portfolios. So we said, okay, let's take this back to the 70s. And here's a traditional uh, return versus volatility chart. And any hunters in there will, will notice the big red squares. It's like a shotgun blast. It's all over the place, right? There's some high returning, high vol, low, everything kind of in between. The little blue diamonds are essentially a sharpshooter. It looks like a rifle uh, pattern, right? Very, very close together, um, which is a bit surprising. Um, and so I think we skipped the... This is a little early, but, but for example, here's an example. So this goes to the 70s because you can't take this back all the way to the 20s because some of the asset classes didn't exist. But global GA, that's for just global market portfolio, the percentage that I showed you guys earlier. That's if you just bought the world. But, it, but it'll go to show the characteristics that are slightly different from 60-40, the global 60-40, and GAA. So you can see it ends up pretty similar to 60-40, but there is an improvement. You get lower volatility for one, a higher sharp ratio, which is a measure of risk-adjusted returns. Um, a great, another rule of thumb, sharp ratios for asset classes over time always cluster around 0.2, 0.3. Um, and then portfolios cluster around 0.4 to 0.6. And, and that's a pretty accurate representation of what they'll probably do. In any given decade, they can be all over the place. The S&P has been everything from negative sharp ratio for a decade to like 1.4. But over time, they cluster in that same sort of number, which makes sense. Now, the interesting part about this book and this study was we looked at, I think, like 15 different portfolios and had even more in the appendix. And so here's an example of five pretty different ones. And these are real returns. But, but a couple different takeaways here. One is they all move up to the right, good. Two, um, they, they kind of move around differently. And so one, if you look at like the 70s, for example, 70s were terrible for pretty much everyone. I see some older folks in the audience. They may have remembered this. But a time of high inflation, uh, really poor asset returns, but also huge dispersion in returns. So if you were investing in permanent portfolio, which I think is 25% uh, um, cash or short-term bonds, 25% gold stocks, and long-term bonds, I think that's right, um, you would have done well largely because of that huge allocation of gold. Uh, if you would have done 60-40, you would have got pummeled. You, certainly, if you were a professional manager, you would have been fired by here. If you weren't fired here, you would have been fired by here. Right? You would not have stayed in business this entire decade losing money for your clients when they said, well, why couldn't I? This wasn't published yet, of course. Permanent portfolio, I don't think. It's still the 80s. Um, but why couldn't I do these other allocations? Let's switch to that. Obviously, it's high inflation. We need these real assets and other things in our portfolio. Well, then, of course, what happens if you switch? What does ne better for the next two decades? Well, it's everything that's growth-focused on equities, on international equities. So all of these portfolios outperform the others. So if you chase returns on these asset allocations, you actually cost yourself about 1% returns per year. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the permanent portfolio had the lowest return but it was uh, the most consistent across decades. So I think it was one of the few that had positive real returns in every decade. However, let's say I gave you guys a crystal ball. And I said, you know what? If you've seen this movie, Back to the Future, Biff goes back to his younger self and he gives him the sports almanac, which the answers to all the sporting bets over the next few decades, makes a ton of money um, and becomes a casino magnet. Marty wants to stop that for lots of reasons, such as marrying his mom. But let's say I gave you guys a crystal ball. And I said, tell you what, I will allow you to go back to the 1970s, and you can pick any asset allocation portfolio from this book. How much would that foresight be worth to you? Probably a lot. Millions, certainly, if not billions. How much would PIMCO or one of these big asset managers pay for that? Um, a lot. 
I said, however, there's one catch. There's always a catch. These crystal ball sort of scenarios, and that's you have to implement it with the cost of the average mutual fund today in the U.S., and that's 1.25%. Maybe higher here. I'm not sure. Um, asset weighted, it's a little lower, but 1.25%. That's the rules. So you can pick the single best portfolio of this entire simulation with perfect foresight in this book, but you've got to implement it with the average mutual fund cost today. Average mutual fund cost today in the 70s and 80s, by the way, probably double. Huge commissions, bid ask spreads, expensive index funds didn't exist, yada, yada. Well, what would that have done? The best performing portfolio was the El Arian. Makes sense. It's very heavy in stocks. Huge growth focus. What was the worst? Permanent portfolio, which isn't really fair because it's pretty low volatility. But had you implemented El Arian with the average mutual fund fee, you would have taken the best performing asset allocation in the book and made it almost as bad as the worst. And let that sink in for a second. To me, that is a huge, very profound takeaway. It can be depressing depending on your, on your um, perspective. But then I said, okay, you know what? You don't trust yourself. You're a crappy investor. You're too emotional. Chase asset returns. Even though I give you the crystal ball, you can't trust yourself. So tell you what, you have to implement it with a, a financial advisor. So on top of the 1.25%, you gotta pay 1% to the advisor, who's gonna help you do this. You take the best performing asset allocation portfolio and make it far, far worse than the worst. And to me, that is a really fundamentally interesting takeaway in the sense that most people spend the time on the, and remember how different those portfolios were. Some had 25% in gold, some had zero. Um, I kind of liken this to, to baking, you know, whether it's cookies or something. As long as you have the main ingredients, flour, sugar, chocolate chips, butter, the cookies will probably end up all right. Does it matter exactly how much you have? No. As long as you have some global stocks, some global bonds, some global real assets, you'll end up okay. But what do most people not focus on? It's the boring stuff, the taxes, the management fees, um, that has a massive, massive impact on the portfolio but a lot of people don't want to talk about it. It's not sexy. What do they want to talk about? What's the best investment? So this is a good example. If you say, what, what, are, the, what are most people scared about? You know, it's sharks uh, where I live in Los Angeles. The lifeguard says, a day does not go by. Someone does not see a great white shark where I surf. <clears throat> Poorly, by the way. Um, I was deathly afraid of, of wolves growing up in Colorado. They kill 10 people a year. Sharks, only 10 people. Elephant, lion, hippos, all pretty low. What kills the most people? Mosquitoes. Not even close. Other humans, that makes sense. Snakes is the only one that's like probably justifiable. Everyone hates snakes. Um, dog. Man's best friend is in the top five. Are you kidding me? No one's afraid of that, really. And then the next six you can't even pronounce or know what they are. Assassin bugs, snails, round worms, tapeworms. But this kind of goes the same with asset allocation. What does everyone focus? Headlines every day. Financial Times. Um, Wall Street Journal. CNBC, what are we talking about? Where, where are the best investments? Where do I want to put my money? What matters? It's the fees. Now, there's some interesting perspectives and takeaway of what people think. So there's been a very, very consistent trend. This is in the US, this only goes back to 07, but money into lower fee funds, index, mutual funds, we manage 10 ETFs, money coming out of the active funds. Now. As you remember in the beginning, I said, I had active, passive, it's a mess, it's a wash. The, the phrase is meaningless at this point. I think everything's active. Going back to quote John Bogle, he says, the conflict of interest in the industry is not active versus passive, it's high fee versus low fee. And so you're seeing this massive, massive trend. Um, I think this <coughs> flow, I don't know if there's going to be a Netflix blockbuster moment where it all of a sudden just goes crazy, uh, but I do think this is something that is a generational trend that will last a while. In the U.S., you have an example of a lot of these automated services coming out that are very low cost, uh, often below 0.3% per year, that will automate your asset management. They're raising money hand over fist, the incumbents in particular. Some people call these robo-advisors or robo-allocators. Vanguard has already passed $100 billion in theirs. Um, Schwab's is technically free, though not really, because um, they charge you on the, well, on the cash balance and not being optimal, but it's a huge trend. And by the way, if you look at all the robots, they all do modern portfolio theory, buy and hold asset allocation. We've back tested every single one of their portfolios. This is Vanguard, Goldman, Wealthfront, Betterment, Schwab. They all do the same thing. 
They all do buy and hold asset allocation, low cost, which is fine. That's a perfectly reasonable way to invest. But if you go back to what we were talking about in the early part of the, the talk, um, that may set people up for some disappointment. Um, and it's just the beginning. If you look at, this is an example in the US, and I think Europe has probably even more ways to go here and higher fee. There's five ETFs that exist that do asset allocation that, man, that charge less than 0.3%, manage about two billion. So not bad, nothing to shake a stick at. But there's over 500 mutual funds that charge more of that, often one, two plus percent per year, and they manage almost a trillion. So a lot of that trend, I think, is just beginning. Um, so we live in a world where 60-40 is expected to be low, where asset fees are essentially the bar has been set at zero for a buy and hold portfolio. You can buy a buy and hold asset allocation portfolio in the US for five basis points of ETFs. All right, you can get the global market portfolio for about five basis points. For all intents and purposes, that's free. And by the way, a lot of ETFs, people don't know this, they often return their short lending revenue to the investors. And so in many cases, there are ETFs that pay you to own them. You have a negative expense ratio. What a world we live in, that's pretty cool, right? But we just said in the beginning of this talk that 60-40, you're gonna get about 3%. So to get higher returns, you have to be different. You have to be highly active and concentrated. Now that's hard, because you look different. So going back to the global market portfolio, this is just stocks, by the way. The US is about half, but the problem is no one owns the global market portfolio. If I ask this audience, raise your hand, zero people probably own it, and the reason why is everyone has home country bias. This happens in every country talk I give around the world. Everyone, this is how much people put in their own stock market versus how much they should. So the US, the answer is always 80%, when it should only be about half. But it's even more egregious in a lot of countries because they have much more market caps as a percentage of the world. So a lot of our Aussie friends are particularly the worst, 2%. When, it, when it's, uh, sorry, 60% when it should be two, but, but it's because they feel comfortable. It's what they understand. Same reason y'all are cheering for a local soccer team where I was out to be cheering for American football. All these things, it feels warm and, and, comp, uh, and cuddly, but it's a terrible idea. Why is it a terrible idea? Well, it's uncompensated risk. But here's an example about market cap weighting indexes in general. So the reason we started this talk with the US is the US is half of the world market cap. So that half is gonna return about 3%. But if you look at market cap weighting, what is market cap weighting? A lot of people don't know this. I'm sure this audience does, but just to refresh, if you were to ask someone, what is a market cap weighted stock index, like the S&P 500? And I asked some of my friends, they said, well, it's the biggest companies. I said, yeah, but biggest by what? They said, well, earnings, sales, no, no, no. It's, sale, it's shares outstanding, multiplied times, price of the stock. That's it. It's a simple trend following strategy. You invest more as they get bigger, less as they get smaller. And that's a pretty good starting point, and that is the definition of the market. So the blue line, S&P 500, the multicolored line, this is originally, I think, by research affiliates. This is what happened if you invest in the largest stock at the time as the largest stock. So Cisco, Google, Exxon, GE. It's a horrible investment strategy. Underperforms the broad market by about three percentage points per year. This is true for every sector. If you look at the largest stock in a sector, underperforms the sector by three percentage points per year for the next 10 years. If you look at foreign indices, global XUS, it's even more pronounced. Um, and you can Google this, uh, uh, I think it's called Top Dog or something, the research everywhere. One of the simplest ways to outperform the market is you just exclude the top few companies, but that's capitalism and that makes sense, right? By the time that some company named Apple is making these amazing phones, well, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of other companies in the world that want to make billions of dollars too and so start making cool iPhones elsewhere, Asia, etc. By the time someone makes these incredible whatever XYZ widgets, someone else wants to. Um, but it's also the, the fact that by the time you get to be the biggest, it's also the biggest just because your valuation goes up. So we said, okay, let's think about this. Let's think about it globally. We went and built CAPE ratios for every country in the world. We were the first to do this, but you can find these now online a couple places. Research Affiliates does it, Star Capital out of Germany. Um, I'm sure MSCI does it. And this huge mess of, of charts, there's a couple takeaways you can notice. One is, in general, stocks move together, right? Um, but there's at times pretty huge dispersion. You can see the mid 2000s, plenty of big bubbles. You guys remember, if, you, if we had the CFA meeting probably in 06, 07, everyone was talking about the BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, gonna take over the world. Well, uh, India and China were trading Cape ratios in the 40s and 60s, pure bubbles. A lot of them in the late 90s. And of course, the granddaddy of them all, 
the market historians in the audience will probably recognize Japan, the biggest bubble we've ever seen, hit a value of almost 100 in the late 80s, had negative returns for the next 20 years. By the way, guess who was half of the world market cap in the late 80s? Japan was. So if you were a global investor indexing Vanguard 101, CFA 101, you would have had a negative 2% return headwind just by investing in Japan for the next 20 years. So the problem with indexing is valuation independent. So does this work historically just like it does in the US? It does. The less you pay per bucket, the better it is. Stair steps down. The red boxes, the good news is US is trading around 31. Um, this is everyone's favorite. Oh, sorry. We're a little, little too quick ahead of myself. The reason it works, we often say mean reversion, the most powerful force in investing. It's probably getting to be bonus time around here. You know, you probably had an amazing year because everything was up this year. You're thinking about the, the chalet you're going to ski in. You're thinking about the vacations, opening your account statement every day. Well, Investing has a way of humbling you. So if you look particularly at the extremes, so you buy when there's blood in the streets, when CAPE ratios are super low, future returns are really strong, 20% per year in the next five years. You buy them when they're really expensive, that's a really dumb thing to do. You're going to get negative returns most likely over the next one, three, five years. Um, now we're at everyone's favorite slide. Sorry. So we publish these once a quarter for all the countries in the world, and this list changes all the time. Um, the USA is the second most expensive country in the world at 31. Um, foreign developed ex-US is at 20, so totally reasonable. Not great, not terrible. Foreign emerging is cheap, 16. And the cheapest bucket, if you look at out of 45 developed and emerging market countries around the world, the cheapest bucket trades at P CAPE around 12. Uh, that's up from, I think, around 8. Um, simply because it's appreciated so much in the last two years. But there's a lot of takeaways in this chart. Um, the first one is, by the way, we don't just use CAPE ratio, so we, we calculate four 10-year metrics. Uh, we use 10-year uh, uh, price, to, uh, sorry, cash flow, sales, maybe book is the other one, and average them, because oh, and dividends. By the way, you could sort on dividends and it works just as well. Um, because some, uh, some countries have, their stock markets have structural reasons. So Australia, for example, are incentivized to pay higher dividends, so they'll always have a higher dividend yield relative. But we look at all of them, we average them out. It says the same thing. U.S. is second most expensive country in the world. Again, we don't think it's a bubble, but it's expensive. Um, the good news is most are reasonable to cheap to very, very cheap. Now the problem, so going back to the old market portfolio, if you have the market portfolio um, and it comes client review time, and you're not doing well, you can say, look, I, sorry, we just own the world. Like that's, we're buying old investors, that's what we do. And your clients will probably be totally fine with that. And they understand, because there's always something doing well, and there's always something doing poorly. If you go back to the, your office after this meeting, you say, boss, client, wife, I just heard this amazing speech. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sell all of our stock holdings, and we're gonna go buy some Russia and Turkey and Greece and Brazil, round out with a little Czech Republic, maybe a little Poland and Spain. What do you think? And they'll say you're crazy. Um, but fast forward a year or two, there's two outcomes. You outperform, pat on the back, say nice job. Thank you, advisor, you did well. Uh, they do poorly, you're fired. Right? Who in their right mind would have bought these countries? Now, this doesn't feel so bad right now. So we, we actually published a book on global valuation in 2014. So I started giving talks on the valuation aspect of this talk in 2014. And this was a very different reception in 2014. Let's go rewind back of the last few years. Russia's invading countries. Um, half of Europe is falling into the Mediterranean with the economies, unemployment rate of 50% for youth, all these things that are terrible going on. Brazil went through a great depression. Um, it was much harder to buy this basket than it is right now because a lot of these uh, countries are up 20 plus percent per year in the last few years. Um, but even then, that's what makes value work, right? Value works because this side is hard. And by the way, the PE ratio, what's the big mover in the PE ratio? It's not the E, it's the P. So price moves a lot. And so a lot of these countries, they're cheap simply because they've declined 40, 60, 80 percent already. The stuff on the right side, and we don't we, we used to just put all the expensive countries, um, is expensive because the price is hitting all-time highs every day, right? U.S. stock market, all-time high. So historically, it's been much better. Two takeaways on value. Um, one is that 
it's not, every, so many people get this wrong, a value approach is not just about buying the cheap. It's also about avoiding the expensive. And that's really important. Okay, so it's not just about buying the cheap stuff, it's also that you're avoiding the Japans, the India and China when they're in 40s and 60s. It's about not doing the dumb stuff, and the dumb stuff right now is investing in the US. So how would something like a concentrated value approach work? So we did factor tilts, we actually added in um, of the most famous French Fama factors, there's value, there's momentum. Um, so we did it in what we called, we took the market portfolio and added all those factor tilts. That gives you about another 2% per year. The problem with the implementation of the factor tilts is it's very seductive to then to try to hire a manager that charges one, two plus percent per year to implement those. Vanguard, by the way, just launched a bunch of factor funds in the US that charge 13 basis points. Uh, so here's an example. So had you done US 6040, World 6040, that old GA market portfolio that we showed you, and then GAA plus, you know, the, all the smart beta value tilts adds about 2% per year. Awesome, right? Well, we go back to our old example. If you implement that with the average mutual fund and a financial advisor, it totally destroys the entire point of the exercise. So the whole point of looking different is great and the value you add, except for the fact if you pay too much, it renders the entire exercise meaningless. So you have to implement this with fees in mind. So we're almost done, by the way. And not a single peep out of the audience. This is great, you guys. Um, uh, hopefully there'll be lots of questions afterwards. So implementation. Look, a lot of this stuff is pretty simple. The value, things you can update once a year. A global value approach, by the way, if you devalue, if you update it more than once a year, you're going to hurt returns. Quarterly or monthly, you don't want to do value. You need, it needs time to work. And so we show a lot of the, I mean, how many millions of dollars and hundreds, if not thousands of books on dieting. I mean, that's a pretty simple equation. Calories in, calories burned. And I, I understand it's a little more complicated than that. But in general, if you burn more calories than you consume, you're going to lose weight and vice versa. Same thing with this investment plan. It's important. It's pretty easy to be a good investor, but it's also pretty easy to be a horrible investor. And one of the reasons why is simply we're human. So this is a good sentiment survey. This is in the U.S., but it goes back to the 1980s. And it shows, ask people, are you bullish, neutral, or bearish? There's another one called... Um, investors intelligence it goes back to the 60s but you can see over time the red X is the average and we're pretty close to average right now which is a little surprising for an eight-year bull market going on with markets hitting new highs and I, it's starting to feel a little more bubbly and euphoric now although it seems to all be directed towards cryptocurrencies but but if you went back and said all right let's look at the range when were people most bullish on stocks the literal worst month to be bullish in the entire history of the data set. The month that had the single highest valuation of the past 40 years, January 2000, people were most bullish. When were people most, most bearish? You cannot make this up. This isn't a joke. People were most bearish in the exact worst month to be bearish of the entire sample, March of 2009. And so it just goes to show emotions, particularly sentiment at extremes, works against you. And to be mindful of that, this isn't something that you can necessarily implement really easily. And another good example um, of something that you want to be rules-based, we're a quant shop, everything we do is, is rules-based, uh, at least to be aware of it, because it's very tempting to behave poorly at times of stress. Um, and, and then one last example, we wrote a book called Invest with a House. In the US, you can look to see what any investment manager his portfolio, if they manage more than $100 million, um, once a quarter they have to publish the long book 45 days after the quarter close. So December 31st, Warren Buffett's portfolio comes out on February 15th. Um, and it's called the 13F filing. And, and there's some in Europe too. In Europe also, some, uh, some countries disclose the shorts. These don't disclose the shorts. But so we wrote a book on this because as a quant, I said, well, what if I just wanted to go follow? And you'll recognize a few of these, Uncle Warren and Charlie, Julian Robertson, um, David Einhorn, Seth Klarman. Uh, what would it look like if you just followed these guys blindly? You bought the top 10 stocks they bought, did it once a quarter, takes five minutes. Best part, you don't pay them any fees. So here's the example on Buffett. This goes back to 2000. And it destroys the S&P 500. You can invest in Buffett stocks. He beats the market by five percentage points per year back to 2000. Let that seek in. That beats 99% of all mutual funds out there. You pay him no fees. It takes about five minutes a quarter. He doesn't trade much. However, this is a big however. 
from 2000 to 2008 ish, crushed it, outperformed five of the seven years, 2008 ish, or nine, I can't remember the exact turning point to today, he underperformed this strategy, not he, but the strategy of tracking his top 10 holdings, underperformed the market eight of 10 years. So you blind this and don't call it Buffett and call it the local uh, Zurich money manager, particularly just starting out, say, this guy, say you make an allocation to this manager, client, wife, partner, boss, let's buy this new fund, I really like it, it's low cost, it's actually zero, but uh, let's buy this new fund. Underperforms year one, okay. Review time, what was the process, what are they doing wrong, okay. Year two, two in a row. I can't believe you brought me this dog. We'll talk about this next year. Year three, that person's probably fired, right? Forget year four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Underperforming eight of ten years. And part of the reason is so much in investing plays out over such long cycles, decades long. Value has been a stinker the last 10 years. And so, um, but the amazing part of this is you go back to 2000, he still has outperformed 99% of all mutual funds. Five percentage points per year. That puts you in, five percentage points per year puts you in the Hall of Fame. By the way, you go back to the 70s, it's 10% per year. The value add of this approach, the value add of any, I would argue, asset class and strategy is the ability to stick with it. And the challenge, of course, is becoming asset class or investment agnostic, not becoming wedded to something. And so Buffett's alpha is not his approach. AQR did a research paper where they just wrote a formula. It's value, it's quality. Basically, that's it. It's got larger cap over time, but that's it. It's basically value and quality and a little bit of leverage because he gets some free float, but yada, yada. Um, and so you can replicate it with literally just a formula. But that's not his alpha. His alpha is he sticks with it. Eight to 10 years of underperformance. How tempting is it to go muck around with your investment strategy? Okay, well, maybe we won't use you know, price earnings. Maybe we'll use some growth characteristics, or maybe we'll switch. Um, and I think this is a very familiar feeling to a lot of people because it's hard. No one, all clients think in terms of month, quarters, very few think in terms of years and decades. So, quick summary, and then we can break for snacks and questions. Um, the first thing is to try to set expectations realistically. Come up with some um, broad probability of what is the likely outcome. And you can plug in all those indices earlier. So for example, uh, US stocks, we said about 3%, foreign developed ex-US about six, foreign emerging about nine, and then the cheapest bucket probably around 12. So by the way, with current bond yields at 2%, how do you get to 8%? You have to put the entire equity portion in the cheap stuff. Who's gonna do that? No one. So first thing to think about, un unrealistic expectations, take your medicine, spend less, save more, go on a diet, exercise, all that hard advice. Second, move beyond stocks and bonds, think about the global market cap portfolio, but to outperform, start thinking about value and tilting away from the US. Remember the US is half the world market cap and it's the second most expensive country in the world. That's going to be a huge headwind. I think it matters less here than and then traditionally when I give that talk um, stateside because people put 80% in the US there. So it's at least good to, to have less elsewhere. Um, we actually didn't mention trend. We didn't get to that. Ran out of time today. Uh, but for those who know us, we write a lot, of, a lot of, write a lot about tactical and trend following. Um, you guys have, might have to have me back next year, and we'll talk about that. And lastly, we do hundreds of phone calls and chats with investors. I can think of maybe a couple times anyone has ever said they have a written investment plan. Meaning, here's the rules, here's what we're going to do, we'll review it once a year. Almost everyone is kind of shoot from the hip. Here's this, uh, what we call sort of patchwork portfolio. Here's what we're going to do, and we'll talk about it next year, and yada yada. But that leads to bad behavior, sort of like having a no real diet plan would too. Um, and it just ends up kind of being this bowl of soup. So having a written plan at least gives you something to work off of, and we highly recommend it for everyone. Uh, you can find what mine is, we publish it online. Um, and it keeps you from the bad behavior as well. That's going to be it. I'm happy to take some questions now if we can. Uh, do we have time? Uh, you guys got any questions? Anything good? Come on, I can ask myself some. Let's see what else we forgot. Um, 
what, what do you mean by trend? Is it momentum? Or? So there's two close, um, and by the way, here's a good example we can go with since we have time. I'll ask myself my own questions. Um, trend following and momentum are close cousins. Momentum historically is meant relative strength. So you're comparing, let's say, if you're looking at global assets, you're comparing usually the last 12 months, but there's a lot of ways to look at it. Gold versus U.S. stocks versus bonds versus tips versus real estate. What's had the best performance? And you concentrate in that asset class or stock or security. And historically, momentum has been the best performing factor of all the factors. It's hard to implement, high transaction costs, etc. There's a lot we could talk about that trend is a close cousin where it's only looking at one asset class. Is it going up? Is it going down? So a historical trend falling indicator would be something like the 200-day moving average uh, or something like that. So we've, our oldest paper, which we actually just wrote a, um, we revisited in the new journal portfolio management coming out next month, is um, trend falling, people get wrong often because they think it's an outperformance strategy, but what it's really doing is reducing your volatility and drawdowns. It keeps you out of the long 40, 60, 80% bear market, um, tells you when to get in and out, but it's usually not going to increase returns. Momentum on the flip side is meant to be return enhancing because you're concentrated. And so if you actually marry the two together, you pick stuff with high momentum that's in uptrends, you end up with some pretty great performance. But that's a way to get pretty tactical. It's hard for a lot of people. Um, a good example, a pretty classic trend following asset class would be managed futures. You know, CTAs had monster years in 2008. Most of them were up 30%. They've stunk it up since. And, and it's hard for people to allocate, same reason um, allocating and looking different uh, to an asset class like that for so long. Um, one more thing, since no one asked me questions, I'll just ask one. I said, Meb, all right, let's say you're in the US. Everyone wants to think of binary terms. This is one of the biggest mistakes we've ever seen in investing. People, it's always, for an ex let's say an example, should I own gold or should I sell it? We'll talk to a client. Stocks overvalued, should I be in or out? And it's never, should I reduce it a little bit? Should I sell 20%? Should I buy a little more? It's always in or out. So an example, and people really struggle with valuation on a macro basis, and here's an example. Let's say the year was 1993, and we were having this conference, and stocks had just done 17% per year for the last decade. Monster bull market. But valuations are starting to creep up, so Cape hit 20. So getting expensive, nowhere near where it is now, but hit 20. And so a lot of famous macro managers were saying stocks are expensive, people were acting crazy, it's time to... It's time to be a little more prudent, right? Well, people will say, Meb, you can't use CAPE because CAPE shows for the entire, almost entire history since 1993, stocks have been expensive. Therefore, you're an idiot and you're wrong. You can't use valuation. I say, okay. Stocks did almost, I think it was like 9.5% per year. You would have given up 1,000% returns sitting out of stocks. But we don't live in a world of nothing else. So if you invested in bonds, you did pretty good too. You did like 7% per year. You missed the two huge, you didn't even have a bear market. So you sat out the two 50% plus bear markets. If you switched into stocks when they were cheap, so 08, 09, you would have had almost the same return to stocks, but, uh, but without the drawdowns. But again, this is missing the whole point to me. People want to think in terms of binary valuation on one market, but the way to think about it is the world is your oyster. So if you then said, no, I want to invest in um, the cheapest markets wherever they are, and so this is that value approach we were talking about, where if you're looking at valuation, this beats the S&P by like five percentage points per year over that period because you're investing in what's cheap. And so it's not uh, uh, an easy ride, and those are kind of the returns. Sorry, it's too small. But it's a good example for people when they're thinking about binary terms of valuation. That's not, we don't think, the best way to use it. Anyone else think of any other good ones? Isn't it because China was cheap during this period? Um, well, you we got to remember that the, the, no, no one country will ever um, have a massive impact on this because you're investing in the top quartile. So right now it's about 12 countries. That's also a great point because um, there's two things. You never just want to go out and buy one country because that's the same as buying one stock. And some of these countries are pretty small. Uh, so if you just go put all your money in Brazil, don't, ta don't, don't take that as my takeaway. You want to buy a basket. So we say the top 12 countries, so that's about the top quartile of the world's market cap um, is a reasonable diversification. Uh, even though emerging is cheaper index, about half of the, the cheapest bucket is, is developed because it's a lot of Europe. Second caveat is that you get to some of the smaller countries um, 
you just got to be a little careful because the, the market cap of like Greece and Czech Republic is pretty small. It's about the same as like Best Buy stock is in the US, right? So, um, so when you get to the tail end, and that's why we don't, we used to publish CAPE ratios for frontier markets like Argentina, but we said, I don't want to be responsible for people going out and buying these 10 companies. Um, so uh, we, there's a couple of different indices you can use, and that's another reason we balance the valuations out. So Greece for, is a, there's like two examples it rarely matters for, but Greece, depending on the index you use, has a CAPE ratio of two or minus 10. So um, we try to average them out across all the, all the various metrics. But China, China is an interesting example, and we tweeted about this um, a few times, because China was super expensive in the mid 2000s, and then got cheap again when everyone, and it had horrible returns for years. Um, everyone hated it a few years ago and was finally cheap again and then had a nice run. So it was in, so our largest fund actually does this, by the way. Um, uh, was in the portfolio for a year, then got kicked out. Uh, another good example is Japan. I mean, it took like 20 years for Japan, 20 or 30 years for Japan to get back to cheap. Uh, and then it was finally cheap and no one wanted it. And if you remember, Japan was the best performing stock market in the world. It was like three years ago, I think. Um, uh, and this, you can do this either local returns or hedged. It doesn't really matter over time. It varies, of course, in a given year, but it doesn't really matter. Any more? Otherwise, we'll get snacks and I'll stick around. One more. How do you marry uh, valuation and momentum? That is my favorite question. Thank you. Uh, so the, the way this talk originally was, and if anyone here from Geneva, no. Um, I actually gave a slightly different talk in Geneva. And I tried to squeeze in the momentum and trend, and it's just too long. And um, my, if you were to ask me, Meb, what is your perfect desert island investment? It is a cheap, hated market that's catching momentum and starting to trend up. But the good news is that's a lot of the world now. It wasn't the case two years ago. Um, so that's just from one asset. Or um, the way to think about it, though, is it's a, it's a great yin-yang. Value and momentum and trend often are good diversifiers to each other. Uh, so what is a value investment is often not the same thing as a momentum and trend. So if you look at momentum and trend, the US, great momentum and trend for the past nine years. As a trend follower, you'd be happy just sitting there. I mean, Bitcoin, great trend. No valuation, but great trend. Um, so there's a couple ways to do it. So if you, let's say you look at just US stocks, for example. You could sort US stocks by value, rank them. You could sort them by momentum, rank them, take the average and buy the best. Or you could sort them by value and then take the best value by momentum. There's a lot of different ways that it usually kind of washes out. Going back to the value talk, it's more just about your thinking about it in the, in the first place. What a lot of people do is they'll use momentum as a final filter on whatever their approach is. So they're like, here's our universe of 500 stocks we really like, but we're going to take the top 100 by momentum. They're not necessarily using momentum trade because the trading costs can get high. Um, and then trend following is a little bit different. Again, it's kind of a cousin because there's a lot of different ways to implement it. We use three different trend following funds. One is up like 17% this year, one is up like five, and one is down. Because they all have very different markets. Some short, some don't. Some are managed futures, some aren't. Um, but but a, an interesting way to think about it too is if you look at one market top down, so the US for example, and you were to put it into four quadrants. Cheap, expensive, uptrend, downtrend. The best quadrant historically, not surprisingly, is cheap uptrend. The worst quadrant is expensive downtrend. And, but the second best quadrant is expensive uptrend, which is where we are now. The problem comes when that flips from expensive uptrend to expensive downtrend, then you go to the worst returns. Um, so uh, we like to say the valuation for us is like a yellow flashing light. The trend following is the red when I would say it's, it's no, no time to own it. But we don't have bear markets anymore. You guys want a great stat. I'll leave, I'll leave you today with the most useless stat, but interesting. In the US, we've never had a calendar year where every single month is up. This is it, December. We've had 11 up in a row. We've actually had 13 up months in a row, which is, depending on how you look at it, either a record or only happened once in the 1950s. So it's a pretty interesting times. I think if I was here last year, and we were predicting what's going to happen in 2017, it would have fooled all of us, right? <laughs> the lowest volatility on record for many asset classes, many asset classes having exceptional returns, consistent. Um, that's what makes our job fun. Thanks for having me. I'll stick around and chat with everybody after.